Hey everyone, welcome to episode 332 of F-Stop, Collaborate and Listen with your host, Matt Payne. On today's episode, I had a fantastic time sitting down and chatting with Hans Gunnar Aslickson. Hans is a fabulous nature and landscape photographer based in southern Norway with an extensive background in graphic design and art. Hans leverages his background in design to make beautiful and evocative images of the natural landscape. This week, we explore these techniques and hopefully offer you, the listener, some actionable tips to improve your photographs. Before we get started, I wanted to invite listeners to support the podcast on Patreon. I use what's called the value for value model to sustain this show, which depends on your support. The value for value model operates on the premise and assumption that you get value from listening to this podcast. In exchange for that value, you provide me with some form of compensation at your own discretion and you help pay for it. Since only you know what this content is worth to you, I give you plenty of options for supporting the show. If Patreon isn't your thing, we also accept one-time or ongoing donations through PayPal and Venmo. Heck, I'd even accept gift certificates in the mail if that's your thing. Whatever this show is worth to you, I'm grateful for the support that you can provide. Thank you in advance. As a bonus for supporting the show, you'll gain access to our bonus episodes and early episodes depending on the tier that you support at. This week, Hans and I recorded a very thoughtful discussion as a bonus episode that I think you'll all enjoy. Okay, let's get to this week's episode with Hans Gunnar Aslickson. All right, Hans Gunnar Aslickson, it's great to have you on the podcast. Yeah, thank you for inviting me, Matt. I'm uh, really honored to to be on your podcast. Uh, I guess that uh, all of my favorite photographers have uh, been on here, so... I'm really honored to be in, included in um, in your podcast, Matt. Yeah, of course. Um, I would be remiss if I didn't mention that you've easily become one of my favorite photographers as well. So it's great to have you here. Ah, thank you, thank you. Yeah, of course, of course, of course, and of and of course, uh, I recently did an article on you for On Landscape Magazine, which was a lot of fun to do that, and it got it gave me the opportunity. To get you to know you a little bit better through that process, which I think will help us with the podcast. Yeah, I was. Uh, it was really interesting to to read your thoughts on my work and have have you experienced it. And um, I really like the um, the color analysis you did on my images, uh, Matt. That was uh, really interesting. So, so I guess that's a. Uh, that's a good way of getting to know each other a little bit, talk about the yeah. work and dive a little bit deeper. Yeah. Well, for for people that don't know you or about your photography, why don't you go ahead and tell us a little bit about yourself? Yeah. My name is uh, Hans Gunnar Aslaksen, and I live in the south of Norway. That is the southeast of Norway, pretty near the, the coastline here. That's about uh, two hours drive south of Oslo, the capital. And I live here with my wife, uh, which like me is also a graphic designer. And I have uh, two kids, or well, they're not kids anymore, I guess teenagers, 17 and 20 <laughs> years old. Mia yeah, and, uh, and Ludwig. And uh, we got our cat named Sansa. And I guess that everybody who has seen Game of Thrones know where that uh, name comes from. That's awesome. So um, I'm not a full-time uh, photographer. Uh, I just do my photography as a hobby when I have the time for it. Uh, I'm an educated uh, graphic designer, and um, I've been working in agencies with uh, marketing and branding for almost 20 years. So now I'm actually made a switch from from the market industry to um, to work uh, as a designer for a student welfare organization, hmm. and that's uh, that's really nice actually because it's not uh, not so much sales and profit anymore. Uh, it's about uh, working with good communication with uh, students and just uh, promote uh, benefits for them like uh, healthcare, housing, and food and so on. So it's more much more of a people approach. 
So that really suits me, I think. So it's not so much uh, push on the sales and profit anymore. So that's that's really nice. So I've just been in that uh, work from August, so pretty new there, but I, I really liked it. So that's nice. very nice. Awesome, awesome. And mm. what what got you into photography? Yeah, well, uh, I guess that uh, I've always been fiddling around with a camera. You know, um, I say I'm a graphic designer. My education has been on an art school, where the first year was drawing, and then two years with the visual communication, uh, more like a graphic design, and then the principles of that. And then later on, two years uh, at uh, Westerdahl School of Communication, as more of a um, working with concepts, ideas in advertising, and also graphic design. And it's I think this is the graphic design bit that kind of stuck with me, and I've been working mostly as that. So, uh, so photography is a natural link to that that area, that profession. So I remember that on our art school, we actually we had a photography as part uh, of a, of the education. So we worked with film in that day when we were down in the dark rooms and so on. And uh, that was uh, kind of the basics of it uh, when I learned that. But uh, and mostly I think that I was just uh, taking pictures back then. I was not uh, photographing. Mm. Uh, but later what's on the uh, during... Yeah, what's the difference? Yeah, when, when you're taking pictures, you're kind of more documenting and more like uh, you know, something just to keep the memories alive, you know? But uh, when you're photographing, you, you kind of think differently and then you're in a different mood, I think. You will try to express something and, and dive a little bit deeper into it. And uh, you need to, uh, to, to wor- work a little bit more um, down to the base of it, to the core of it, and uh, express yourself in a, in a different way than the usual snapshots, I think. So it was during work, actually, that I met um, a professional photographer and he... Um, was also like me, like to be hanging out in nature and doing the hikes and so on. So he took me on to a trip to some local waterfalls that I haven't hadn't been to. That was uh, really great, actually. And he was uh, taking pictures of those. I was just tagging along and drinking coffee and having a good time. But that uh, that uh, was really interesting to me, and I I was really motivated to try to do that myself. So he um, recommended some Fujifilm cameras to start with, because the great thing with Fujifilm is you get all the buttons and so on. So it's uh, it's a really m- kind of a manual camera. It's an easy way to to learn how to use one. So I started out with a Fujifilm XT10 back then, and slowly starting to uh, to try to un- understand the, the concept and so on. I'm thankful for YouTube. I learned all the basics uh, from that channel. And so you can get, say that I'm a self-taught photographer, but um, I got uh, pretty fast hooked on it and it escalated, you know, the interest as well. So I'm now I'm, I'm uh, kind of always thinking about photography. It's always there on my mind. So I think I have uh, found my calling now. Nice. Well, if you don't mind, Hans, I would I would love to spend a little bit more time learning about your background in drawing and visual communication. And mm. I would love to just maybe you can tell us a little bit more about what are some of the things that you learn about through that. Yeah, uh, you know, they are very much related photography and, and graphic design. And uh, when I went to art school, we learned the basic of uh, composition, you know, the golden ratio, the rule of thirds, and all that stuff. And also color theory, the color wheel, and how to work with the complementary colors. So that has been a great advantage for me, I think, in my photography, because uh, having that uh, knowledge as a base, it was quite easy for me to put that uh, into practice into the landscape photography part of it. And, and also with, with drawing, uh, it's, um, it's really close to techniques in Photoshop like dodging and burning. Mm-hmm. So when you're drawing, you kind of just only work with the shadow part. You don't only work with the shadows because the brightest part is the paper, right? So you... You draw and uh, you try to shape the objects, try to understand how the light works, and make it more 3D. 
and that is basically the same principles when you when you dodge and burn in in Photoshop. But that is um, that is a more um, advanced method, I think, in Photoshop. Because, but you because you can also work with the with the highlights and so on. But um, to understand how light works and how it um, shape an object, I think that's uh, a really good um, good thing to know. And of course, the color theory has been a big advantage for me. Yeah, I'm, uh, I'm a big fan of uh, complementary colors, and uh, the lesser colors, the better. I think. I think less is more. Also, in uh, when you are talking about uh, color work. Yeah, I would love to dive deeper into color theory because I think when I think about a lot of my favorite photographers, you know, I feel like complementary use of color and complementary color and how they use that to not only enhance the image, but also to, to lure the eye into different parts of the image in different ways, I think is kind of what differentiates them from the rest of us, including myself. So I'm curious, maybe you could talk a little bit about kind of what your approach is to color theory when you're using the camera. Like, what are you looking for? How do you know that you've struck gold in terms of finding the colors that work well together like how does that how does that work yeah well i think that uh, the basics i think that is good to work with is uh cool cool tones and uh, warm tones so for instance uh, if you think of a traditional uh, image like uh, like a sunset and so on when you get blue or dark shadows and you got warm highlights and maybe get some orange and yellow tones in, in the warm highlights, I will try to use the U and maybe uniform that so that I'm not a big fan of bright yellow. So if you can U the yellow towards the orange and, uh, and the shadow part, uh, try to turn that even more cold and you get uh, more of a blue color there, you're kind of down to orange and blue. That is complementary colors. And uh, it works very well when you get that push and pull through the image. So uh, you can effectively cool down parts of the image that is not so interesting. And maybe parts that you uh, mainly want as a supporting role in the image. And um, be very precise the way you want the, the eye to go through the image and, and warm up the highlights and... Uh, the important stuff that uh, that leads the eye through it, but also in in the smaller scenes, I am um, when I look for those, I uh, look for colors as well. And if I see complementary colors in some panels or something, that uh, immediately uh, get my interest. Yeah, that that was going to be my next question because it sounds like for you, it's a mixture of field discovery in terms of okay, here's a here's a cool color and a warm color. I can combine this easily, but it also sounds like oftentimes it's a matter of refining it in the digital darkroom to push hues a certain direction so that they're more complementary. Does that sound pretty accurate or is there more to it? Yeah. Yeah, that's right. Uh, uh, I do believe in the principle that uh, less is more. Uh, and also when it comes to color, so we try to uniform the colors um, so that uh, uh, the blue tones uh, have a kind of the same um, same uh, values of blue and the warm tones uh, also. So I don't have uh, a lot of different types of colors to work with, but um, uh, the less I got, the easier I get. And I think that the stronger the image will, will get. So... Uh, that can really really help the composition i think so um and it's um i think it is important to try to uh, separate those colors as well as much as you can so that you get a good separation between warm highlights and cool cool shadows so i work uh, work very um, closely with that in in, in photoshop so uh, i like to use uh, color balance you know and uh, luminous the masks i guess the Listeners are familiar with uh, with that uh, kind of a technique. So choose the um, the mask and the um, and the highlights and warm those up. And choose the darker mask for the shadows and cool those down. 
we get a separation. I think that works uh, works pretty well. And I think it's always good to to maybe get a white balance status a little bit on the cooler side uh, when you um, enter uh, Photoshop. Uh, yes, I've, my friend David Thompson, I think he teaches that as well. He starts out pretty cool and then he layers in the warm tones as he's building the image up in layers. Yeah. I think that is uh, much easier if, if the image is too warm already from Lightroom. Um, if the warm bounce is a bit off and too warm, I think it's been a little bit hard to get that right in Photoshop. So I think it's it's a safer way to to have a cooler image, a cooler white balance uh, to start with. And then it's easier to, to warm up the highlights and you got kind of control of the shadows already. So uh, I think that's uh, that's a better approach, but because you can only uh, you know push the highlights a little bit warmer uh, in the end. Yeah, and I, I, I've seen some photographers where you know maybe there's a a scene where there's like wildflowers in the foreground, and you've got this nice sunset or sunlight or whatever sunrise image, um, and I've seen them completely change the colors of the flowers. So like for you, like how far is too far in terms of transforming the colors that were that were you, what you actually experienced well when i started out i did a lot of uh, wide on wide angle photography since i live near the coast uh, here um, that uh, seascape photography was a natural place to start and i guess that i used the first years only on the wide angle on the 10 millimeter and on the wide angle and you know the usual recipe close to the foreground getting low and uh, get some pointy um, program elements, enhance those, and uh, try to try to lead uh, lead those into uh, yeah, a point of risk, interest, uh, uh, C stacks or whatever. But <laughs> when I first started, I, was, I did all this uh, wide angle stuff, and that um, that included the sky, right? And I think that uh, the the problem with uh, with uh, the sky, usually at sunset, it gets pretty weird. The colors, no, you get all these pinks and so on. So it's hard to kind of find those colors in the natural environment on the ground. So um, how to avoid that? I usually now exclude the sky to avoid that problem, actually. And I think that the sky gets uh, too much attention from the subject. So now I mainly shoot without the sky and pretty much uh, a lot of it is just straight down. And then down to more like natural colors. You can work work with those that, that you find and there's not much uh, so much, uh, you know, uh, I don't turn to you so much uh, anymore like I used to. So it's, it's more of a natural color palette now, I think. And I just try to, you know, push the colors a bit more uniform so that the warm warm tones are a bit unison and uh, and the dark uh, shadows uh, and the cool tones as well so uh, I don't have that kind of problem anymore that I have to tweak the colors a lot but uh, I'm, I'm not a big fan of that I think that it can look a bit unnatural and I think it's too far so so less is more I guess so try to do, do subtle, subtle adjustments uh, yeah, it sounds like to me you've kind of moved into this space where it's more about just massaging and f fine-tuning the colors that yeah. you uh, naturally find and then just making sure that they're harmonious and that there's not too many tonal variations. Yeah, yeah, that's right, uh, absolutely. And, uh, and uh, the great thing is that you don't have to spend so much time in processing anymore. It's, it's, it's a, a quick job, you know, just to work with natural tones. So nowadays I mainly work with with contrast work, a bit of uh, dodging and burning, and uh, just just carefully, uh, you know, tuning the color zone, but, but not a big deal, actually. So it's, it's a pretty much uh, straightforward work, but... Uh, as you said before, Matt, if you start out with a with a cool cooler white balance, you're, you're you have a good start to to make the final adjustments in, in in Photoshop. I love it. Well, let's let's talk about composition a little bit, um, especially from someone who has so much expertise in visual communication. I'd love 
for you to tell us your thoughts on negative space because I feel like ever since I can remember, I've always been told, you know, fill the frame with your subject yeah. and avoid negative space unless you're thinking about like the cover of a magazine or whatever. But what what's your mm. thoughts on negative space? Yeah, I think that is um, it's a difference between negative space and what I call dead space. Uh, I think that um, you know if uh, if there is an image that is uh, kind of a tight composition with a lot of elements and there's nothing in the bottom right corner uh, that doesn't help the composition, I think you can call that dead space, and that uh, should be avoided. So I think that negative space is more like, um, for instance, if you got the icon yin and yang, that's kind of mirrored shapes, but the dark parts is kind of the main, if that is the main subject, the white part is uh, is the um, negative space, is the mirrored shapes. So negative space can also, uh, when you compose with uh, correct mirror shapes and enhance the main subject. So it can sort of play a supporting role, I guess. Let's... And, uh, especially with minimalistic shots, you know, uh, negative space is really good. It, um, it can uh, provide a, a great amount of, um, of breathing space. I think it can be important. Mm -hmm. uh, so it doesn't look too cramped and you get um, the subject can stand up more if it's uh, kind of a lone tree or something in, in a wind landscape. So I think negative space used right is uh, is a very um, strong tool to to have in your yeah in your tool set. I love that you talked about breathing room, and as yeah. we were talking about uh, having the dead space in the corner, that's a compositional challenge that I'm often faced with and struggling to kind of work through when I'm in the field. Like for example, it might come upon a scene that's got some maybe some rocks in the foreground and maybe there's a tree and some mountains above or whatever, but I'm always trying to make sense of my this foreground piece first because I'm trying to figure out... So, for example, let's say we've got a big, chunky boulder in the lower left corner of the photo. I'm yeah. always trying to wrap my head around, okay, does it make more sense to like have that boulder just occupy the whole bottom left corner with no space around it? Or does it make sense to give some like just a little bit of empty ground or whatever around the boulder and i'm always going back and forth between those two things and i'm wondering like what's your approach to solving some of those challenges yeah that's uh, that's always a challenge i think and um but what i mainly do uh, when i uh, approach composition in my work i i don't take out the tripod or the camera uh, uh as the first thing i do I usually use the phone and pinch zoom and so on and work with that uh, and small steps, you know, just to see if uh, if uh, things work. And, uh, and I sometimes uh, I do the most. I try to capture the essence of the scene. I get really close and start with that. And then I can get a little bit wider and add more and more elements to the composition. And I'll look for my camera and see uh, which one I think is more effective. And, uh, you know, down to the question, so what is this image really about? And, uh, and try to find a balance with, um, you know, uh, where is it interesting composition? And when is it too much of the elements? And when it's kind of too bare, too, too easy and doesn't uh, kind of... You, you need something that, uh, that pulls you in. So it's, it's always a fine tune to find, find that balance. So mm -hmm. it's a uh, it's a lot of legwork, uh, up and down, and you know, side stepping and so on to to find uh, exactly the right spot. So, but uh, it can be really difficult for you because uh, nature isn't perfect. So, but I think <laughs> that if you if if you work with a composition and uh, and be patient and use your time, I think that uh, that may be the key. Because if you rush things, you will probably regret later. I want to go back to something you just said because I think um, it's much more important than people are, they might gloss over it. Um, and you talked about starting in tight and then adding things in as you go getting a little bit wider and wider and wider. 
And I find myself going between that technique and the opposite where I go wide and then I get narrow and narrow and narrow. Mm. Both techniques are kind of the same idea in terms of reducing the image down to what it's actually about. And, and, and one of the things that I constantly see, you know, in judging my competition and things like that is that people don't take enough time to consider looking at all of the other elements in the photograph to decide whether or not they help tell the story of what the photo is about or if they take away from the story or distract you from the story. And like you said, I think most of the time, less is more. But there have been a few times where, you know, I've got the less is more composition, but then there's this supporting thing over here that I just can't quite get in the photograph, you know, and that mm. can always be frustrating. But I wonder if you could talk a little bit more about your approach to writing what the photo is about and how to determine what to include or exclude. Yeah, I think that uh, when I started out, uh, I was uh, struggling a lot with uh, uh, with uh, that uh, problem. You know, it's uh, a challenge, as I say. I think that if you, you know, the main benefit, um, I shoot a lot close to home. And uh, the benefit with that is that you can practice photography often. And I think that uh, you get to train the eye. And, and the more you do it, the better you get at it. And uh, nowadays, I kind of more get a gut feeling for when the composition works or not. So, um, so now it's, it's usually uh, actually the, the kind of the first attempt that is the best, I think. Uh, because I also think that you can overanalyze an image. Uh, an image should be experienced, not analyzed. So, you know, in the gut feeling and the first thing you kind of do when you have some exercise, that may be, um, be the best, I think. Because if you overanalyze and get more, uh, you know, kind of... You follow the principles, okay, uh, now I've done that, maybe I should do a bit uh, on the lower third and so on. You start applying rules to it. It can be too obvious and it can be a bit boring, I think. Mm. Because you, you can have something there that is kind of the X factor that uh, maybe you can't actually put a finger on it, but it makes it a whole lot more interesting. Yeah. But I think, it, I think it's come with, with experience. I don't know how about you, Matt, but um, I think that experience uh, goes a long way. And uh, I guess that you, you got to spend a lot of time out there to, to come better at this stuff and um, uh, do kind of your own um, experience and discoveries out there. I totally agree. I mean, I'm all about practice and failure and learning from failure. And I've certainly made plenty of bad photographs in my in my time yeah. to, to learn from. But also, I think this is where, you know, something like um, like our competition book for the NLPA, like getting that mm. book and going through that book and like trying to, you know, what do you like about certain images? What is, you know, what is the X factor that that image has that what? pulls you in that you might not be able to explain? And I think just by viewing lots of really great photography, is also a form of practice, in my opinion, because you're yeah. going to start to yeah. recognize some of those visual patterns or those X factors, as you put it, um, when you're out with the camera, especially for people that, yeah. you know, maybe you only can make time to get out to make photos a few times a year, you know, so. Yeah, yeah. But do you do you, uh, do you shoot close to home as well, uh, Matt? Do you have something? Uh... You live in Sometimes. Colorado, right? <laughs> yeah, I mean... <laughs> I, I do. Um, it's interesting. I find myself shooting closer to home, like in the winter, when it's harder to travel, yeah. or it's harder to hike and things like that. Um, like a good example is, I think it was back in January, we had this really fantastic snowstorm that rolled through. And I think there was like a NFL playoff game. And I was like, Nope, I'm gonna stop watching the game. And I'm gonna go make photographs of these trees that I remember seeing on a hike back in the summer because yep. I knew that they'd be fantastic covered in snow with blowing snow. And I yeah. had a really good time with that. And it was mostly just a exercise in 
composition and exercise in you know, experimentation with different shutter speeds. Um, and I didn't have any expectations going into it, but I came away with some, some really fun images. Yeah. So, so you're just uh, around and about to make visual memories of what can, uh, what can work at uh, other season and so on. And yeah. But uh, how how close is uh, is these things? Uh, can you can you rush out when the conditions are good, or do you have to drive for some hours and uh, so on? Oh, I mean, this place I'm talking about is like a three minute drive. Yeah, <laughs> that's it. Yeah. yeah, and then I've got a I've got this whole mountain park above me. That's yeah. you know, in 45 minutes I can be really deep up in there lots of trees and overlooks and things like that that I can experiment with too. So yeah, I think photographing closer to home, even if it's not an image you want to share with the world or you don't think it's, you know, gallery worthy or whatever, it's still yeah. going to give you the opportunity to experiment, to try different compositions, yeah. bring it back, look at it, um, self critique, you know, maybe get feedback from a friend like, Hey, do you like this? Do you not like this? Why? Um, so, but yeah, like, even if you don't live in an exciting place, you should be trying to do this stuff, I think. Yeah. Yeah. Totally agree. But do you, do you have, uh, or do you often, um, shove your edits or, or images to, to others before you release them to get some, uh, some critical feedback and so on, on, on the edits and maybe the compositions and so on? Yeah, um, so I have a really good friend of mine that I usually we will send each other our images and say, hey, like, tell me what you think of these. Yeah. And 95% of the time, he gives me feedback that's like, oh, you messed this up, or man, like, why did you process it that way? Or, hey, yeah. you should crop it this way because it'll be much better. And then I do the same for his images too. Um, and I think it helps to have someone else who's not you look at your work just to they might see something that you missed because i think we get really attached mm. especially if it was yeah. a moment that was really special we we mm. tend to you know it's a psychological thing we tend to ignore flaws and the things that we're proud of and so yeah. it's important to get that feedback i think yeah I totally agree, and I also have some uh, photographer friends that I send some early edits to to, to get some feedback. So yeah. I I usually um, I usually do some kind of test edits uh, quite early after a shoot, uh, just uh, two minutes in large term, just to, just to see, and often send those kind of sketch edits to uh, to my buddies and see if it, if this is where. Yeah, worth um, working on uh, or any potential and then I get some feedback uh, on that and then I can kind of think about it and just let it uh, what do you call it, marinate for a while yeah, simmer, let and, it simmer uh, <laughs> and see if, let it simmer yeah, that's what you call it Yeah, uh, I, think, I think that is good to get a kind of uh, fresh eyes on it and, and see if it, uh, if it if it can work down it's, it's usually a, a, a good image I think I like to, like to do this uh, sketch edits, and um, I, I keep them on my phone so I can uh, look at it quite often. Uh, and then I can, you know, uh, the more you look at it, uh, the more you can see the, the flaws, and you, you can see that uh, it's maybe it's a lack of contrast, maybe it had some dark parts that you need to do something with, and maybe the, the color work are not uh, precise, but. Uh, if you can spend some time with it, I think that's um, uh, that's really an advantage. Being in in, in a hurry to do things is, is not uh, a good way to do uh, any part of uh, photography, I think. Yeah, I agree. I mean, I used to... Um, so when I started my photography journey, it was mostly just documenting these mountain climbs that I would do. And so I was like in a big rush to get home, quickly edit the photos so that I could write my story about what the hike was about and then posted on my blog and that was kind of the my mode of operation for a long 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 time and I kind of carried that over into my photography trips that I would start doing and I quickly learned that that was not necessarily the best approach to editing because you rush mm. things you miss things um, and you get sloppy but I've also found that if I wait too long to look at stuff I forget 
what I was even thinking when I captured the image. And so there's like this sweet spot. So I kind of like what you said, where you yeah. get back, you quickly edit just a little bit, not like fully, but just a little, just to kind of get a feel. And then you kind of let it sit for a little bit and you revisit it. I think that's a really nice balance. Yeah, that has, uh, that has uh, worked for me. Uh, because as I said, if, if I don't do anything with the images, I kind of <laughs> uh, forget them a bit. And you get this huge uh, back in the archive that is uh, it's a drag to look through again. So, so I think it's good to, um, to follow the gut feeling a bit and uh, do some sketches on uh, some of those uh, shots that uh, get some... Um, some potential in them, and uh, uh, I guess that it's it's good to have a, a fresh memory from from the shoot when it, when you do that actually. But yeah. then give it give it some time to let it let it simmer and to analyze it a bit more um, afterwards. Yeah, I love it. Well, let's 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 talk a little bit about small scenes. I know you had alluded earlier mm. to the fact that you know, you find yourself more drawn to making images of smaller scenes. And I'm curious, yeah. like, at what point did you make that transition and and why? Well, uh, I did the whole wide angle stuff uh, for quite uh, quite some time. And uh, I think that it, uh, in the end, I think that I followed the recipe uh, for every shot, looking for foregrounds, getting down low, uh, close to it. Hope to get some good light. Uh, that means uh, fire in the sky, a lot of colors. And if you just do the same thing over and over, you will get uh, a bit bored. You will get uh, demotivated. And I think that progression is is really important, uh, especially in photography. There's so much to learn, so much to explore. So why do the same thing all over again every time, right? So the the buddies that uh, I do most photography trips with that is uh, Morten Eriksson and Roger Kristiansen. Yeah, those those are re really great guys. And um, we actually we didn't know each other before we um, met, met each other through uh, for Instagram. So that's uh, one of the the good uh, good stuff with uh, with social media. But. Um, they started to use the long lens to mix things up and they kind of pushed me over to do it because I, I was very comfortable in doing the wide angle stuff. Uh, the scenery where I live is, is not too photogenic. So if you have taken the shot at the uh, beach uh, we, we got there, which is called Mölln, which is, um, I think it is Norway's largest beach with the rolling stones. Uh, but it's not, not uh, any epic mountains down here, but it's a one one big stone on the beach that everybody shoots, right? <laughs> so, <laughs> right. <laughs> if you if you have done that uh, enough, you know, and with splashing waves, you get all soaked and you damage the gear, and so on. You get it's it's very hectic to do those kind of shots. So, what I love about uh, the uh, the intimate scenes is uh, is the slow approach. It's more of a therapeutic uh, approach and. Uh, and it's so good to just be in your own bubble for a few hours, you know. Uh, and time flies, and you're in a... I guess you can easily get to, into the flow state. And I can easily change focus and be totally immersed in photography when I went out doing small scenes. Because I think that the, the joy of discovering the small scenes is a big part of it. And uh, usually you get more unique shots that you can call your own because it's your view on things. It's not the uh, well-known uh, uh, compositional spots that have uh, others have been taking photographs of uh, so many times before. So why copy that? Why not uh, make your own shots? So that uh, I think that is more me. It's it's more Sam, and uh, that's more me, I guess. I like it. No, it's a. Uh... It's almost like the difference between going on a treasure hunt versus buying a lottery ticket and hoping you yeah. win. You know, it's yeah. um, like when you win the lottery, it's pretty amazing, but most of the time you're not going to win versus when you go on a treasure hunt and there's treasure to be found, yeah. you get surprised constantly by what you're going to discover and find and things like that. Do you ever find yourself going back to shooting wider scenes or have you just completely moved past it? No, I, I, I do it, but uh, not so much uh, locally because uh, there's not mm -hmm. too uh, too many spots that uh, that uh, wide angle 
is is the right tool to use. So I'm kind of done with that locally. But uh, you know, when you to Iceland and uh, stop the speech and so on in the epic landscape, it's, it's hard to not use the wide angle in in those kind of sceneries. Right, so like there's a. a- there's a massive aurora explosion over Vesterhorn, and and you're the guy yeah. with your seventy to two hundred pointed down at the grass. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> like that just doesn't sound right to me. <laughs> no, you know it's uh, easy, it's easy to get carried away with those the type of uh, of, of landscapes. So uh, so yeah, I I think it's um, it's a fun factor, you know, to use the wide angle. Uh, it's kind of dynamic. It's more in your face. Uh, but I must admit that even if I'm at the Westerhorn and doing that stuff, it's it's a fun factor to it. But um, deep inside, I know that this is not an image that uh, I will print and hang on the wall, you know. Mm-hmm. But uh, but I will for sure uh, use it. But uh, I think it's, it's it's the smaller scenes that really have captured my attention. I think that. Uh, the uniqueness and the personality you can put into those shots are just priceless. So um, I'm I'm very obsessed with those uh, kind of things now. I love it. How but how have you? Can, can I ask you your yeah, uh, yeah, yeah question, yeah. Matt? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, I was thinking, but you have done a lot of hiking, a lot of wide angle shots, but um, um, haven't you uh, done a lot of intimate scenes lately and uh, used uh, the long lens more and more? I think I have noticed. Oh, yeah. I mean, gosh, I feel like unless I'm climbing a mountain or backpacking really high up into the mountains, my 100 to 400 probably almost never leaves the, <laughs> at least the camera, you know, it's, yeah, yeah. I feel, yeah, I'm, I'm using it almost exclusively these days right here, you know, like that's basically yeah. 90% of my images are with the 100 to 400 now but i that's why i asked you the question because um and it's interesting i feel like we're almost identical because when i'm local or um places that i've been to over and over again i find myself more intimate scenes but if it's a place i've never been to before i'm kind of reverting back to using the wide angle a little bit more just because it's exciting again and it's more interesting and it's you know it's a different uh experience but Similarly to you, I find myself more excited about and happy about the images that are of smaller scenes that are unique to me that have been infused with something of myself. Yeah, totally. And I, I think that the the issue with uh, with wide angle is that uh, no matter location, it is uh, it, you just follow a recipe. You know, you have to have uh, foreground elements, find those get low, get close, leading into something of interest, um, epic mountains and so on. And uh, uh, I guess that you also need a little bit of luck with some good light. But um, with smaller scenes and long lens, you can just do, you can do everything. You can experiment and you can, there's no, there's no rules anymore. So you can be much more creative, I think, in, in that regard. So it's, uh, I think that is a uh, much more creative freedom which which I really like. So um, so no more rules, Matt. <laughs> yeah, it's interesting because when I do use the wide angle lens, I'm trying not to follow recipes or things like that. But to your point, it's really difficult because you know, at the end of the day, in order for a wide angle image to be interesting, you do need some of those rules or not rules, but you do need some way of creating visual interest that doesn't distract you from this wide scene. Like you do need to have elements within the scene that kind of anchor things and add flow and whatnot. And it's, that's, you know, that's why those formulas have been created because they work. (laughs) Yeah, it does. It's it's very effective and it's very, it creates images that are very easy to like. So I remember when I did a lot of those that it uh, got a lot of traction on Instagram back in those days. But I mean, uh, nowadays uh, Instagram is kind of dead, I think, Uh, especially when you're posting smaller scenes and and so on. But, uh, you know, um, I gotta admit that it's, uh, it's it's pretty cool when when your favorite photographers like William Neal and Alex Norega, David Thompson, and so on share some of your work. That's uh, 
that means uh, a lot more than uh, all these uh, likes on Instagram that uh, you can um, you know relate to the uh, photographers that you uh, look up to and that you admire yeah hundred percent I'd rather get that kind of attention than you know two hundred and fifty thousand likes on a iconic scene that everyone's already seen before personally yeah for sure that's me though that's me <laughs> that's, that's where i'm at in my journey if you would have asked me that same question 10 years ago i would have given you a different answer so you know that's yeah, yeah probably we evolve too. you know yeah. and that's that's i feel like if you don't evolve like that's probably not great you know what i mean i don't know yeah, uh, I know know some uh, some photographers that started out. I guess it was around twenty sixteen or something that they got uh, really interested in photography. Uh, they started out about the same time, and they haven't, you know, kind of moved on to smaller scenes, long lens and so on, and still uh, go for the old wide angle. But uh, they have kind of been demotivated and do photography anymore. Uh, because I think that uh, the problem is that just repeating themselves. And uh, it's easy to think that, well, uh, I uh, have been here before, I have better light uh, back then, um, so why make uh, another copy that is not so good? So I think that uh, the creative process is, is one of the fun part with, uh, with photography. And, uh, and, uh, and failures, as I mentioned before, Matt, I think that is an um, important part of it. So we got to embrace those um, and dare to experiment and dare to do things the, the wrong way to, to push ourselves a little bit further. And I think that uh, a failure can be a, a good step to creating something new. So it's, it's not wasted. It, it's a part of the process, I think. Yeah, and I think it's important for listeners to hear me say this. So turn it up. If you really enjoy making wide angle images and you haven't gotten bored with it and it's still enjoyable to you and you've tried making small images and you hate it, um, we're not here to tell you that you're wrong. Like we're just telling you what, mm. what works for us and why we've moved to different things and why. And if, if that's not your why, that's cool too. Yeah, that's uh, exactly. There's no, no right or wrong. And, uh... Uh, I mean, uh, the best part of landscape photography is that you spend time out uh, in nature. And, uh, you know, it's uh, maybe wrong to, to call the food or shoot a failure if you don't, don't sink at home with any good images. Because you have been out in nature and had a great time. And, um, and that's, uh, that's the most important uh, part of things. So, uh, so it's just uh, what I feel and what uh, my process has been. So... Uh, to everyone else that still love the wide angle, go for it and, and have a great time out there. Exactly. Well, I have a challenge for those people because this is something that I've started doing early on in my transition. Is I, I, and I still use I still do this technique, but I'll use a wide angle lens for smaller scenes. Like I'll get out my a twenty one millimeter lens and I'll find a composition on the ground that has all these interesting elements like. Wide angle doesn't necessarily have to mean big scene, right? Yeah, exactly. Yeah, that, that's very true. You can enhance elements and the composition when using a wide angle close to the ground, uh, shooting straight down, for instance. So, so that's the same. But uh, it doesn't have to mean that you uh, you take the typical wide angle lens with foreground and leading lines into the point of interest and so on. You can use it in. in a lot of different ways. So, um, but I think that it's uh, everyone should uh, should try to experiment a, l a little bit more and try to be a little a little bit out of their comfort zone because it's so easy just to to do what you think that you master. But um, for me, progression has been really enjoyable, and uh, you know it keeps things fresh. And I advise everyone to to try that uh, once in a while. Well, and. At risk of being repetitive, and hopefully there's more to this question than talking about photographing intimate scenes, but I'm curious, what are some other ways you've been able to infuse some of Hans into your mm -hmm. images? Like, what, what does that mean? How do you know that you've, when you've done it? Like, what's your approach to that? Yeah, well, I, 
I usually go out with uh, with no expectations, and uh, usually just to see what the, what the light brings and what what the scenes bring some interest, and just react to that. If it is a scene that um, needs drama, I'll work with that. Or if it is a quiet scene that needs some subtlety to it, I'll. I'll definitely go with that. So, uh, but I think that I have uh, maybe a tendency to um, to end up with a lot of more uh, quiet, subtle work that is um, not uh, is images that is not screaming or shouting, more of a whisper and just uh, images that you need to spend some more time with to discover its uh, true essence and. Uh, uh, I think that uh, the late bloomers is uh, maybe the ones that will stay with you for a long time. I love, I love, I love that. It's funny. I was trying to formulate my own answer to my question, and yeah. at the end of the day, we're all drawn to different scenes for whatever reason, and I, it might not even be that important to ask why. The more important thing to do is to go with it and to explore it deeply. Yeah, definitely. And I think that if uh, the more time you s you spend out um, uh, with a, with a typical landscape or a scenery, the more the true character of the place will reveal itself to you. So, uh, if you're able to, to invest in in spending a lot of time out there, I think that uh, things will get more in interesting. It's about uh, almost everything that when you go uh, deep into things i think that's the where the exciting parts are you try to get under the skin of the scenes and uh, really digest it so kind of related to this i remember when i was making this transition into these types of images i was on a casual trip with um, sarah marino and alex noriega and a few other people and i remember saying like how do you guys do this? Like, I, I just don't see it. I can remember saying that to them. I just can't see this stuff. And okay. of course, like we all have the capability of seeing it. Um, so for you, how do you find images that are just hidden in plain sight that most of us mere mortals would just simply walk on by? <laughs> yeah, I think that's a, uh, that's a really um, a great part, you know, to, to be able to, find things that are really hidden in plain sight. But I think that uh, the main thing for me is the, the slow approach to take your time and not rush and, uh, and be curious and explore everything. And uh, again, I think it's uh, important to, to train the eye. Um, so if you think of the landscape and the scene, not as uh, rocks or branches or hillsides, but more as uh, geometric uh, shapes and patterns and try to uh, uh, see them as uh, abstract uh, shapes. I think it's uh, it's more easier to recognize things that are repeating themselves and shapes that are echoing or mirrored. And I think that uh, also, as mentioned before, that if you get some complementary colors going on, that is also a good sign uh, that things are... Um, to make an interesting image because of the patterns and so on can also consist of colors instead of of uh, purely shapes. But uh, but the slow approach I think has been the key and, um, and not have any uh, high expectation or pre-visualized images in your head and just be open and, and use your time time out there. So if you train that you can recognize uh, things and you suddenly start to see things then you see it in other players and another place and another place and suddenly you see them everywhere. Uh, so that's uh, pretty strange, but uh, I guess that it takes time. You gotta invest time and you gotta be at ease doing it. If you can be uh, really focused on it, I think that's uh, that's really important and uh, kind of clear your mind or or anything else and just uh, immerse yourself into the landscape. Yeah, I love that. And I think there's another really fun technique you can use to just practice this like in your day-to-day -day life. And people might look at you and think you're a little strange, but I'm always like, yeah. if I'm at a like farmer's market or a grocery store or 
or, you know, somewhere in public, I'm always like, oh, look at those patterns. And I'm just looking at it, you know, just through my fingers, yeah. like as I pretending like I'm creating a frame. I'm like, oh, yeah, yeah. that kind of works. Like, oh, those colors work together. Yeah. Like, you know, you don't have to make a photo, but like you're still practicing using, you know, that part of your brain that starts to have that pattern recognition. And, you know, it's just another form of practice. Yeah, it is. And I think it, it, it's good to, to be mindful about it and uh, and see this uh, stuff also without the camera and uh, think it is as an exercise. And I guess uh, we are the weird ones, uh, Matter. <laughs> we, we stand out uh, in our local community. But uh, so I, um, I have found uh, a lot of nice uh, small scenes, uh, you know, close to parking lots and close to the city and some nice water reflection um, just by the water where there's a lot of buildings and, and so on. So um, it's, a, it's a little bit uncomfortable, I think, to take images when there is a lot of people around. It's not my favorite exercise. You know, uh, there are a lot of interesting uh, things to, to find on very unusual places. Oh yeah, my so, my favorite uh, my favorite is like you'll be making one of those images and people are like, "What are you What are you photographing?" Because they you know they're yeah. like, "Is there like a Is there a moose or a tiger over there or something?" You're like, "No, it's just a tree." <laughs> yeah, yeah. People don't really understand when when you're on the tripod and shooting straight down to the ground. They don't. Uh, I get a lot of those questions. Uh, people are coming by and what are you taking pictures of? Well. <laughs> You might not uh, understand it, but uh, it is a leaf. <laughs> but look at that water droplet. <laughs> right. Like, yes. And then, uh, yeah, and then they're like, oh, okay, let's um, see you later. <laughs> yeah, yeah. They, they don't uh, stay for long. <laughs> yeah, yeah, which is fun. Like, sometimes yeah. I love it when people stop me and they're like, oh, are you getting any good photographs? And I always want to say, like, no, it's terrible. Yeah. <laughs> you know, it's I, yeah, yeah. I hate it when people come up and bother me like that. It's just so annoying. But that's me. Yeah, it's just, uh, you know, um, it just breaks the flow state, you know. You're, you're just out of the bubble, a bubble and the magic is gone. And you're just, uh, that totally ruins it for me. Same. So same. we have a local beach forest uh, just a few minutes uh, from me where I have taken uh, some of my shots. And, um it's also a pretty popular place to do walks and, uh, and jogging and so on. So it's it's, uh, it's almost uh, always a lot of people there. So if I try to do some photography there, there's usually someone that knows me that comes by, you know, and want to talk and blah, blah, blah. But uh, so that really doesn't work with me. Uh, that is not why I love photography. You know, it's uh, it's uh, kind of, uh, I love the isolation and the, the mindfulness when you can be in your own bubble and just uh, not think about uh, everyday's uh, stress and all things at work and at home and so on. So, so um, yeah, it totally ruins it. So leave us alone. That's right. Leave us alone. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> all right. Well, I only have a couple more questions for you, Hans, and I'm going to, yeah. I'm going to, switch this up a little bit so it's i'm throwing you a little bit of a curveball but um so last year you were in the top list of people who made it to the finals in the natural landscape photography awards and i was wondering if you could maybe talk a little bit about that experience for you on that side of things i mean i was on this side of it in terms of organizing it and prejudging and organizing all the judges and all the processes and things like that. But I'm curious what it was like for you on that side of things. Yeah, well, um, I think what is uh, great with your um, competition is, is uh, of course, uh, more of a natural approach to it. Uh, and for me, you know, uh, I think that uh, the judge uh, panelists is really great. A lot of my favorite photographers there, and um, you know, thinking about that, uh, Thea Basboom and Alex Norreg and Sarah Marina and so on, have been uh, dissecting my images and analyzing those and uh, and praise those in the composition. That uh, is really meaningful for me and uh, a great honor, actually. So I think that um, those type of images that are in this composition is the ones that really favor these days. 
so much good uh, photographers and so such a great artist and fantastic images that really speaks to me. So uh, I must say that I'm so honored to be uh, in the top 10 in that uh, composition. That is really motivating for me. So it, it really get a kind of recognition and so in, in, in the right, uh, with the right people, I think is, uh, is, is everything in that, uh, uh, yeah. So, um, so for me, that has been a really good uh, experience and I would uh, really think that uh, everyone should try to send in images to, to, to your compositions because I think that is um, it's one of the best out there and it's um, have all the right values and, um, and I think that it uh, kind of composition where smaller scenes is, uh, is taken seriously. Yeah, which is nice. You know, that doesn't seem to be the case with most other competitions. And just the disclaimer, like this episode will come out after we've already closed for images. So it's not even a good commercial. So um, for people that are rolling their eyes or whatever. But um, I'm curious, how did you, how did you, what did you think of the, the book that we put out? Yeah, I, uh, I got it uh, right here, uh, Matt. I must say that I, uh, uh, I was really surprised that it was such a high-end book, and the quality is so good. And uh, for me, it's uh, it's a fine art book, and I think that it, it speaks uh, highly of how uh, how good the composition is when it comes to quality and so on. So uh, that's really a high-end product, and I was really proud to be included in that one. I think that my my image was um, placed in the article that Sarah Marina wrote. It was, um, yeah. And I think that's a, that's a real uh, big honor because I, I do adore her work. And I think it's, uh, if that was meant to be that uh, one of my images was an example of what she was trying to get through in that, Im in that article, that, uh, that really is an honor. Yeah, I, I remember very poignantly that she was fighting for your image to, 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 to win the, the intimate um, category because she just was... She was just in love with it, and at the end of the day, it you know is close. <laughs> oh yeah, 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 yeah. That's uh, that's nice to hear. It's uh, uh, that image is in, uh, of, the, of the crooked tree, right? And um, uh, that's a tree I just uh, walk by several times, you know, and not uh, really noticing it. But it was on this special day. It was um, covered in snow, and it was really cold, and we had this kind of strange early light that was diffused and I never seen the tree that way and uh, and I just uh, took an image uh, of it and I really loved it but that's again that uh, you get used to that stuff uh, that you see all the time you kind of not noticing it up to one point that day uh, I really noticed it because it was a bit different than it used to be so I guess that you can find cool stuff almost everywhere absolutely that's um I think that's the secret to having longevity in photography is that you just have to be super open-minded and just have no expectations and just be open to what nature gives you. Yeah, totally. So are you, are you switching out the, the judges and so on for this year's competition, Matt? Or are you kind of we, keeping it we, to the main people? We did. So this year we switched it up almost completely. The only person who's coming back is uh, Theo Boss Boom. Um, yeah. and, then, and then we've added uh, Victoria Hack. Um, yeah. We've added Charlotte Gibb. And we've added Michael Shane Bloom. Yeah. And we've also added Andy Mumford. So it's a nice, yeah. diverse set of judges that kind of, you know, they all have their own unique style and own unique vision and things that they like. So it'll be really, really interesting to see the results this year. Yeah, absolutely. And I think that it's great that uh, it's a different type of people that are there. So you get a, a bit of a, a mix of, um, of uh, photographers and, uh, and styles and so on. And that uh, can really bring some interesting discussions to the table. Yeah, who knows? I mean, with the inclusion of Shane Bloom and... Victoria, we might get more more images that are wide angle that people are liking. So yeah. we'll just have to see. <laughs> I have no yeah. idea. I have no control yeah. whatsoever. <laughs> uh, <laughs> well, cool. Have you, well, changed, have, you 
I'll change the rules uh, number that uh, you can send in also all the photographs to the competition. We, we did. Uh, we decided to make it to where there was no time limit. However, yeah. we made it to where if you want to be eligible to win the overall award for Photographer of the Year, I think more than 50% of the images that you submit have to be within the last three years, I think is what we said. Okay, yeah. So, hmm. Yeah, so yeah, you can so use a mix, mixture of images from old and new, but... Yeah, but did you, did you add a new category uh, this year? Yeah, so we we didn't... So we still have the three main categories. So we've got the mm -hmm. Grand Scenic, Intimate Landscapes, and then Abstract and Details. But then yeah. we also switched up some of the special awards that we did. So we have a Black and White Special Award this year. We have a... It's kind of like a close to home for lack of a better word i think we call it something else but it's basically you know f oh, i think it's called familiar scenes or some some close to home familiar or something like that but it's basically images like you're talking about like oh it's a tree i walk by yeah. every single day and then if one day it was just yeah. awesome yeah maybe i should send in my images from the local golf, golf course i took during winter there you go there you go yeah <laughs> There's also something interesting with uh, abandoned places that is, you know, out of season places. So we should uh, visit the beach in winter and uh, and the golf course and so on. It's got some really nice uh, trees uh, uh, out there. So uh, I did some minimalistic shoots uh, one um, foggy winter day that uh, was uh, really cool, actually. So um, yeah, I had those in uh, an article I wrote for Elements magazine. Oh yeah. So uh, so that's uh, that's uh, I guess is a good tip to to visit uh, ordinary places but uh, out of seasons, no people. There you go. There you go. Yeah. <laughs> All right. All right, Hans. Well, my last question is: Who do you recommend yeah. for the podcast? Who are a couple of photographers that that we should know more about? Yeah, I think that I should uh, recommend some Scandinavian photographers that I don't think have been on your show. The first one is uh, Stian Klo. I don't know if you know him, uh, Matt. I do. Yeah, he has been, uh, has, uh, been uh, you know, Apple, Apple and uh, National Geographic. Someone has shared his images uh, some years ago, so he's uh, I think he's pretty famous out there. But he's from North Norway, and he has uh, had a really interesting progression in photography. And now he, uh, I don't think he uses the wide angle so much anymore, but he has. Uh, some really top-notch images and uh, it's, it's very uh, creative, I think, and uh, really, really good at composition. So I think that he, uh, he will be a good guest. Correct, correct me if I'm wrong, He's he runs workshops with Arlt Eitman, is that right? Yeah, that's right. Yeah, they two do a lot of things together. So um, I think yeah. they do this, uh, I think it's called Lufen Tours and they do a lot of uh, workshops around the world. Yeah. So he will be uh, a great guest, I think. I was thinking about Klaus Oxelsen from Norway. I don't yes. know if you know him, uh, Matt. I do. He he yeah. entered a lot of images to the competition last year, and I think several of them did pretty well. Yeah, that's right. Uh, I think so too. So I have um, I have actually uh, shot a few times with uh, with Klaus on some uh, local trips, and he is he's a great guy, and he has really embraced the smaller scenes. So, and I think that he has a lot to to offer this uh, podcast. And I was thinking about uh, Trim Ivar Bergsmo, which I think did a project he sent into NLPA last year, if you remember him, yeah? Yeah, I'm going to yeah. have to have you spell it out for me in an email, because like, that was a, yeah, that yeah. Was a that's a mouthful for me. <laughs> yeah, for me as well. But he also from North Norway, he's done a, a lot of great stuff up there, and uh, he makes things up. Awesome. Yeah. So I was also thinking about a Swedish guy called Bill Fargren. He uh, has a lot of, he has done a lot of experimentation, a lot of uh, ICM work and so on. But mm -hmm. he has really had a strong progression and uh, really is uh, very creative and uh, yeah, uh, great inspiration for me. So I think that Bill will be a, a great uh, guest on the show. I think he's also uh, creating some music. So he's a, he's a really interesting guy, very creative. So yeah, I think what that. About, uh, uh, what about some some women? What what do you have some Scandinavian women nature photographers that you can recommend? 
You know, I, I don't know so many in Scandinavia that uh, are female uh, photographers and landscape photographers, actually. I don't know. Mm. But I was thinking about, um, I think you should call herself Christian photography. She oh, may yeah. be from German. Yeah. 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 She's yeah. A... Uh, Kristen Weinhold, I think. Yeah. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. 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 She is really creative and uh, I found a lot of inspiration from people that um, are um, that can create uh, great images from mundane scenes that are uh, typical uh, what I have close to home. So I think that that can be uh, just as uh, inspirational as uh, you know from uh, from like images from Iceland where the scene is, is, is very photogenic in every sense of the word. but. Uh, Right. Trying to get uh, standout images from mundane scenery, that's a, that's a struggle. So uh, she's, yeah, uh, she's really great. For me, that just shows a whole other level of genius. Yeah, you have to think about, uh, you feel, I have to think uh, outside the box, I think. The local shots I do from maybe scenes that I would say is not so photogenic at first sight, they may be uh, of the most value to me if, if I make them work, you know. I'm, I'm really proud of that uh, local stuff. Yeah, definitely. Well, Hans, this has been awesome. And we will also record a bonus episode for Patreon all about thinking through the differences between personal vision and replication. So if people want to check that out, they can go to patreon.com forward slash F stop and listen. But for now, I just want to thank you for spending the time with me today. It's been a really a pleasure. Well, thank you for having me, Matt. Uh, it's been great uh, talking to you. Thanks. Yeah. Well, thank you to Hans for the awesome conversation this week on the podcast. I really had a great time. I'm looking forward to seeing your new work soon, and I wish you all the best with your photographic journey. Keep it up. If you enjoyed our chat, please consider supporting the podcast on Patreon. I now fully depend on photography for my income, and any help is greatly appreciated. Just go to patreon.com forward slash f-stop and listen. That's all for now. Thanks for stopping in, collaborating with us, and listening. See you next week.